Welcome back to Wardrobia and my latest guests for the Pod 20 on podcast radio. A couple of great guests, actually, from a great podcast, a true crime podcast called You Didn't Let Me Finish. It's Ben Ando and Victoria Mitzi, and they talk about their podcast, which does get into some pretty gruesome crimes, but it has a really light vibe, and we talk about that, too. We talk about... Uh, why the music on it is so uplifting and jolly and their chat is so casual and natural and opinionated and then they get right into the meat of it and uh, it's a great podcast. We talk about some cases you'll be familiar with and their views on them, including Madeleine McCann Uh, and also the difference between, because they come, they're broadcasters and court reporters the difference between broadcasting and podcasting and uh, yeah it's a it's a great podcast probably as well good because they met at the old bailey they were court reporters for for, uh, broadcast organizations they've actually been in the same room as crims and lawyers and they've seen the justice process in operation and that's not common in true crime podcasts, you know, usually it's people who have an interest in the in the genre, but they've not been involved in reporting it. And these two guys have. But don't let me make you think that it does get all technical. It's, fu- it's a fun podcast. And it was fun to chat to them too. So here they are, Ben Ando and Victoria Mitzi from You Didn't Let Me Finish. Why is the podcast called You Didn't Let Me Finish? <laughs> we'll Victoria both needs to answer you, that. See? <laughs> <laughs> we've long been friends and we've long had, we've often talked about stuff, and every single time it's a common thread that um, when Victoria starts talking, I never let her finish. I always cut her off. I don't know why. It is actually that way around. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. Right, I see. So, so it's always you that doesn't let Victoria finish. Yeah, I, I just talk I don't, through him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It is. I think we both tend to do it to each other. We're sort of um, we're doing the opposite of those people who say they finish each other's sentences. We just don't <laughs> let each other finish at all ever. And so, for that reason, it seemed like a logical name. And we wanted a, we wanted a name that didn't say true crime or anything like that. We wanted a name that just sort of. Um, suggested the slightly irreverent and kind of jokey tone of the whole thing and the fact that there's a certain edge there as well in that you know victoria and i are also friends but there's also aspects of each other's personalities that we don't always see eye to eye on so there's a bit of a there can be a bit of friction there sometimes it's totally news to me graham i might have to go (laughs) because you did mention ben in i think it was the last podcast you mentioned uh was it a test for autism and one of them was was talking to people on the phone and interrupting them i mean is 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 this could you just want to talk us through that just to give a bit a bit a bit of context okay so um everybody who i mean i've got (laughs) everybody who knows me teases me that i've got no empathy whatsoever and i'm borderline autistic I don't, I've never been tested for autism. I don't really think I am autistic, but I'm prepared to acknowledge that as a possibility. I'm self-aware enough to know that I don't necessarily always um, uh, have the um, empathies and the sort of um, emotional maturity that most human beings seem to possess. (laughs) Or know when to talk. (laughs) Yeah, so a few years ago, I mean, I was just sort of like, in fact, I was, I can't remember if I was talking to Victoria, one of my daughters, because one of my daughters is kind of similar to me as well. So we both joke that we sort of get into autistic loops and saying the same thing to each other over and over again. Um, and my nephew is autistic too. So there is a bit of autism in the family, can I just say. Um, and my, I, So I went online and looked at this test, and I did this test, and I came out as perfectly normal. But one of the... Um, uh, well, I say perfectly normal. I mean, everyone, I suppose, is on the spectrum somewhere, but not on the extreme end of the spectrum. But... Um, one of the questions was, do you know when it's your turn to speak on the telephone? That always made me, me laugh because I have so many conversations with people on the phone where we end up just interrupting each other. Well, we're on the verge of, co- of calling it 
just let me talk. Yes. Right, right. But that's a bit too aggressive, really, isn't it? A little it? bit. Wasn't you it? know, <laughs> you didn't let me finish. It's more passive. And, and yeah. yeah. Victoria's a very passive aggressive. She's really good at passive aggressive. <laughs> no, I'm just outright. I don't, oh, yeah. There's no, no qualms about it. So why did you decide to do a true crime podcast? It was sort of decided for us, wasn't it, Ben? I guess. I mean, Don't it's, you it's, think it, it was something that we kind of had to do because it's what we had in common. We've got absolutely nothing else in common. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we met at the Old Bailey. Um, we were both covering a court case. Who were you working for at that time? Was it Colourful? No. Was it, it was BBC one of the London? Asian radio stations. That yeah. was, yeah. I think, that was Sunrise Radio. Sunrise Radio. I was with the BBC at that time. We met covering the same court case and hit it off and just stayed in touch. And then... I, at the time, was BBC crime reporter, although then I became a general news correspondent, and now I've left the BBC. Um, and so we've always had an interest in crime. Victoria's very interested in crime and true crime. I've always been really interested in that sort of stuff. And we were looking at what to do a podcast about, and it just seemed that given the vast experience I have of, of covering um, court cases and trials and crimes, and all the rest of it, and, have, and reasonably good contacts as well. So we've had some really good guests on our, our podcast. Um, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do. And and, and the other thing was, and I'm, I'm horrible. I hope I'm not monopolising this, but the other thing was that to me, you know, true crime. It's really important. It's it, it's a really really um, popular genre for podcasts, but it's also quite serious and it's also quite intense. And I just thought there was room in there in the mix for something that's a little bit more um, relaxed, a little bit chattier. And we'll occasionally have a bit of a giggle about it, even though, yes, the subjects, of course, are often harrowing and awful and shocking. I love the way you're giving it a little bit more thought than we gave it now. <laughs> yes, a bit more kudos. <laughs> and also taking quite a lot of the <laughs> responsibility on. for well, it you, all. What really happened you'd... was we met court reporting. We love court reporting. And I mean, no, that, that I mean, most of that is most of it is true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think also there was some kind of intention for to look between the lines, as Ben says, on one of the awful promos <laughs> that we made. <laughs> no, in the margins. <laughs> in the margins. I didn't even listen. But, you know, yeah. the stuff that perhaps can't be said in, you know, it, when you're actually reporting or on camera or, you know, broadcasting um we could sort of go in with those extra details which sort of enhance so we were trying to look for little hooks and little angles to make us to, to enhance our personalities yeah that's actually a really good point um of, about you know the fact that this is something that that you know when you're with the bbc as we both have been in the past well i have been in the past victoria's kind of still is freelancing and doing bits and bobs but when you have been with the bbc and you, you're on air you have to be really serious you have this persona that you have to put across and it's not really you and your friends will know it's not really you and the colleagues in the court will know it's not really you because you'll have been you know you have you, you develop a very dark you know sense of humor in common with the emergency services in common with people like who work in hospitals you do, you kind of develop this quite black sense of humor about what's going on and and you'll you'll all have a joke and a giggle at court but of course that's never ever seen on air because it would be inappropriate when you're reporting for something as august an organization as the bbc but of course when you're doing a podcast and you're just you you can say the things that you, you can be wholly inappropriate look <laughs> yeah. i finished your sentence <laughs> thank you yeah it's true you can be a bit more inappropriate you don't have to um, you know, dot all the I's and cross T's. Yes, you have to be sensitive legally, and we we take you know strong uh, precautions against, for example, you know, doing a libel or something. But but beyond that, yes, you can say a bit more than you would ever say if you were um, reporting for a you know a, a respected broadcaster. The the new boss of the BBC, Tim Davy. I mean, he, he's talked about impartiality this week, and and his quote is. If you want to be opinionated, uh, if you want to be an opinionated columnist or partisan campaigner on social media, then that's a valid choice. But you should not be working at the BBC. Are you worried that this could affect the future of your podcast then? 
Well, no, because we're not associated with the BBC in any way. I mean, ah, you're taking the, the Gary Lineker defence. No, it's totally true. I mean, the BBC doesn't pay me now. I get I earn no money from the BBC. As far as I'm okay. concerned, the BBC can go fuck itself. I really have no interest. <laughs> ah, sorry, should I? Are we swearing <laughs> that, or not swearing? That's okay. Are we swearing or yeah. not swearing? You can, you, you can swear we, for YouTube, but I'll cut it out for the radio, don't we, worry. We, can I, I mean, reverse we, all the beeps that I've put in our <laughs> content, though? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we swear in the... But that's the thing. We I, I know you podcast. do. I know you you do. Know, we're adults. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's adult content. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I mean, I really enjoyed working for the BBC when I did, but it was just a job. And, you know, I don't care about the BBC, anything other than there's lots of people there who are really good people. I think it's a really important part of the fabric of our nation, but it doesn't control me now. And, that, and the whole joy of this is I can say what I do think, and I can sometimes say things perhaps that are inappropriate or I can make observations about how people were in court that they I wouldn't have dared to say on the BBC because that might have prejudiced the trial but now I can say that guy was a joker's defendant he thought you know he was pulling the wool over everybody's eye but everybody was just laughing at him you know behind their notepads and and so on and so forth so yeah I mean but Tim Davies right I mean the BBC should be impartial and I, I there is a very strong argument to say that in recent years some of its bigger correspondents shall we say or more well-known correspondents have become a, a little bit edging very close to the wind in terms of crossing that line between simply reporting what's been said and and clouding it with their own opinion and that's something that he's probably right to to call out and draw attention to i think it's a really pertinent question i think it's um it's a good question that you've asked because there is some kind of demand or scope for people to be very up to the second now, especially with where we came from, from news. So they can't ignore it. And I don't know if you, if it was triggered by, there was a programme that um, Amal Rajan was doing on Radio 4 fairly recently. Is that, is that Was that the background to your question? No, Did it was just that? that Tim Davey three days ago had, had said this, and then Gary Lineker, who's one of the highest paid presenters on the BBC, basically said, it doesn't affect me because I'm I'm contracted to them, I'm freelance. And I just wondered whether you were worried about the, that anyone who has anything to do with the BBC being prevented in on other platforms from, you know, having opinions, strong or partisan opinions one way or the other. My, my personal opinion on it is because uh, I started out in broadcasting in commercial radio in Australia, where it's a lot know, yeah. more yeah. open. And when I came back to Britain, because I was originally from here, just seeing how this stiff BBC... They, and I always thought I don't cause I don't personally care if a pre presenter has an opinion or even an agenda as long as I know it's like with the newspapers you know that the Daily Mirror and the Guardian are to the left and you know that the Telegraph and the Mail are to the right and as long as you know and you read it with that filter then I think that's okay it's when you don't know and you're being conned I think it, uh, for me if the BBC basically said you know, because I spoke to I spoke to Anna Smith on this program, who does the film review, and I said and asked her a similar question. It was before the Tim Davy thing. I said, you know, you're not supposed to have an opinion. How can you review a film if you're not supposed to have an opinion? Because it right. is just your opinion on whether you think the film's any any good. And she said, well, because she's seen as a as almost as a guest, and I don't know if she is seen as a guest by the viewer. I think the guest thinks she's a BBC presenter telling you this is a good film or not. I don't know, but. I, I don't think people can be impartial. I think everybody's got, exactly. from, from their life experience, has got some kind of view. Why they should be forced to hide that, I think as long as it's open and someone says, look, I'm a card-carrying communist or whatever they are, as long as you know, yeah. I don't see the harm in it. But well, I, I'm in a very small minority. Most people like to it. think the BBC is impartial. And the BBC is an organisation should be impartial but if you're trying to to get human connection which i think is the best kind of broadcasting and it's what podcasting has become and it's a, a huge hole that podcasting has filled it's got like hey I, I you know i mightn't agree with what people say but it's great just to know that because that's what you have friends and acquaintances who you don't agree with but you like hanging out with them because they're just interesting even if you don't agree with anything they say well, that's and the i whole just point just of interaction wonder. isn't it really yeah yeah. So anyway, I don't I don't know what so. I'm trying to say, but I just wondered what your opinion was on that, uh, on on whether. Well, which... I haven't been I haven't been reprimanded, and um, and I don't know if you listened to the episode where um, where I did a big shout out to all the managers I found out were listening. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're still alive. I'm still going. So yeah. So it wow. it shouldn't really. You're not really worried about that about this this. 
this a this new way, focus on impartiality that Tim Davy has, has brought to the organisation. Well, we're, yes, exactly, and and <laughs> and um and also Ben and I have been around long enough to um to know where we stand legally, so we do stay within yeah. those parameters. I did apologise to them for the swearing when they told me that they listened. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I covered myself, I think. I mean, it's Ben's a big swearing. question. It's a big question that you asked there. I mean, and there's. There's areas are, so there's different sorts of impartiality as well. So we've got political impartiality, and this is where, say, the political editor of the BBC is reporting on what both Labour and Conservatives are saying, and in theory is is is, is has, herself not clouding it with her opinions and her views and her interpretations. Um, there is analysis, and analysis, of course, is where you seek to pick apart what somebody has told you either on camera or off camera. But then it's inevitable that when you are interpreting what somebody says, there is going to be um, a suggestion that you are interpreting in a way that suits your own worldview. Yeah. Then there's impartiality in what we're talking about around court cases, around crimes, around legality, where, yes, I suppose we, we would say we're broadly impartial, but at the same time, I think any court reporting, whether BBC, ITV or or in Australia or wherever, most of it would come from the point of view that um, crime is wrong, that killing people is wrong, and that the justice system, broadly speaking, is there to bring people to book. And so, strictly speaking, it's not at all impartial court reporting, because it very much takes the view that this, these things are crimes, they are wrong, um, and, and jailing people or punishing them or, you know, um, dealing with them however the court deals with them, and it may find them innocent, of course, is right. So so that's actually not impartial at all, but it's set against the accepted standards and customs of, of civilised society. And of course, but you're covered by question. a privilege to be able to report the details within the case. Yeah. So, you know, that's an important aspect of being a journalist. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, when the podcast starts up, there's some incredibly jolly music on there that to me, when I, because when I, because I hadn't listened to it before, and I thought, oh, I'll check this out and see what it's all about. And, it's, and, and all I knew was true crime podcast. And then I heard the music and thought, That's a, have I got the right podcast here? Why is the music so jolly and uplifting? Because the things you talk about, the crimes, as you say, murders, some very, very dark stuff. Why did you choose jolly music? For your reaction, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> was, was it deliberate? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just say that the, the, music is in, the music is entirely down to Victoria because when we first did the first podcast, we recorded it together and then she went away, did all the editing, did all the post production, and I listened to it and I just loved it. And I immediately said, I just love that music. It's so incongruous, it's so completely out of keeping with what you expect. And, and that is exactly it. And I particularly love it when you get the occasional stings halfway through. Yep. So we'll finish with one gruesome, macabre topic. <laughs> There'll be a little bit of a ding, 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 ding. And then we'll come into another gruesome, and macabre topic. Ben likes topic. to sing it. That's the other I do reason. like to sing it. I hum it to myself. That's pitiful, started I know. singing since you left the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite understand. Yeah. Swearing and singing. <laughs> I think I'm sweary singing. So take me uh, through the process because practice. you seem to do all the tech things, Victoria, and Ben, what you just show up and and talk. Is that is that pretty much? Yeah, how, I mean, Victoria, and are you in the same room or or is it done in this kind of way? Uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't I mean, seen each other, Graham, no. for for how long now? Long time. We just see each other. We we don't really do. If we um, see each other, it's a mistake and. <laughs> Sort of, years, I'll, ben will pop up in his underpants and I'll go, <laughs> <laughs> switch it off. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> so so I, I live in Cambridgeshire, which is where I am now in my house in Cambridgeshire. Victoria's down in Devon. Um, for personal reasons, she moved down there about, what, a year and a bit ago now, is it? Before that, you were in London? Yes, it's, it's about a year now. Yeah. So, um, and I've been up here for, I've, I've lived in Cambridgeshire for years and years. I used to commute into London and we'd occasionally see each other on stories or whatever. Um, and then... I haven't actually seen you. Um, well, because I was living in London. We, when you yeah. were at work, we'd um, Occasionally, eat burritos. Yeah, yeah that that's was what it. we did. We we had a burrito. Where where are you, Graham? Whereabouts are you based? I'm I'm actually well. Podcast radio is in London, but I'm in Hitchin in Hertfordshire, about oh, yeah. thirty five oh, no, miles north. Down the road yeah. from me, because I'm up in yeah. Huntingdon. Where are you? Huntingdon. Okay, yeah, yeah, not away. that far yeah. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm far away from everyone here. Yes, you are. Devon <laughs> is a long way from everywhere. What was I that know. decision? Why did you move down there? Oh, I mean, it's a lovely part of the world. Oh, I see. BBC yes. Devon. 
yeah. I came here for that, yes. And um, and then lockdown happened, and I was sort of on the verge because my contract ended of coming back. And then I thought, I'm not coming back <laughs> for now. I'll see yeah. what I'm doing. I, I just, you know, children are sort of. Um, yeah, I mean, that's family reasons, really, isn't it? Stuff, I mean, you yeah. know, your your daughter's sort of settled there, and it's a really nice place for her to live compared to um, London. So yes. would you prefer to do it together in the same room if you could? <laughs> well. Yes. Ben, <laughs> <laughs> there was an innuendo I didn't probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be fun. And I think, I mean, you know, you, you, it's worked okay so far because it's entirely audio and we can just listen to each other. And, and you know, Victoria and I have both worked in radio for years and years and years. So we're used to just being on the end of a microphone talking to somebody that you're not in the same room as. In the context of this, I think it might add an extra dimension if we were in the same room, but it's just impossible at the moment for all we sorts of reasons. We should probably outline the fact it was designed to be a lockdown podcast and we both yeah. sort of... It was literally something that was cooked up over a coffee and... Yeah. Um, I, I know everyone makes it sound flippant, but unfortunately, you can probably tell it really was so sort of impromptu. And then we've ended up going because um, we've had more of a um, response, a good response than we could have imagined, really. So, uh, yeah, it's nice that something works by surprise in this business as well. Podcasts are really good for that, I think. Yeah, I didn't know much about podcasts when we started. Victoria knew a lot don't. more. <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> yeah. But no, Victoria knew a lot more about it than than I did, and she was she's always been really hot on, um, you know, the actual technical side of things, as you as you identified. You know, she's the one who does all the technical. Oh, side really of hot! I can do. Work. You pretend not to be able to edit, so you don't have to do it. That's it, really. <laughs> no, but, you're also, <laughs> no, but, no, but come on, you've been you, you know you've you've been far more tuned into the social media aspect of it, the cross promotion, all that kind of stuff. You know, we, so we, you know, we end up. We we did an interview with another podcaster um, uh, a few weeks ago, and and I think that was entirely down to you and you sort of engaging with her on social media and and sort of forming a, I am a, a relationship. I'm a massive podcast listener. I don't know. I don't know if you are, Graham. Is that? You know what? When I was uh, pre-lockdown, when I was commuting into London every day because oh, I used to be in charge at Fix Radio, I, particularly on the way home at the end of the day, I would love listening to, to different things. But since lockdown has been on, I have to go out of my way to listen to podcasts unless I go for a walk um, because I'm just not on the commute anymore, which is why I decided when, I, when Podcast Radio asked me to do this show, which is also a podcast as well as being on the air, I decided to video all of the interviews and put them on YouTube because I figure people have got more time to sit and actually watch video now it's an interesting as well. One. So I, I'm yes. trying to cover both sides. Yeah. So, yeah, but I don't listen to as many as, uh, as I used to. I used, I used to virtually never miss uh, Penn Gillette's uh, Penn Sunday School, Penn Gillette from the Magician's Pen and Teller. Always had, oh. you know, interest in, oh, and he's no, very opinionated. I didn't know about that. Oh, he's listen. a very opinionated atheist, uh, vegan now, and it's it's great wow. to listen to. Yeah. Are they the Vegas? Uh, yeah, in Las Vegas. Outfit. Yeah, Penn and Teller. Yeah. Are they the ones with the tigers? No. No, you're thinking of Siegfried and Fried and Roy, <laughs> Siegfried and which Roy. which went horribly wrong because one of them, either Siegfried or Roy, got almost eaten by one of the tigers, didn't they? Oh, yes, so that I heard. that put a dampener on the act a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't do video for a while. Now, Penn and Teller were the ones that used to show you how they did their tricks. Oh, fantastic. Actually, I'll listen to that. Yeah. So, um, you're not, so you're not listening? Has it gone by the wayside? You're not What I do now, I'm fussier much. now. It's, you know, like I used to listen to every one. Now I look at see what, and I do the same with, say, Mark Maron. I only listen if I, if I fancy the, whereas before I'd, I'd see that guest's name, someone I'd never heard of, usually American something or other. And I'd listen just because they're interesting people. But now I'm, I'm, because I don't listen to as much, I'm fussy. I go, oh, no, I've not heard of them. Skip, skip. Oh, 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 okay. He's yes. got, he's got uh, Jim Carrey on. Okay, I'll listen to that. Yes. So, yeah, I do I've listen got, to them, but not as much. I've how to listen in bits and pieces. How do you do it that? it doesn't take so much time. I, I'll listen to the intro, I'll skip a bit, then I'll listen to a bit more if it's good. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, as you say, I've got a short sort of, slightly short uh, fuse with it. I just give it a burst. Yeah. And sometimes I know if the sound quality is bad, I've got to say this on, you know, podcast radio, that... You, I don't understand. There are so many podcasts which are doing well, which is great. Their content is great, but I just can't stand the crackly sounding like they're in a 
echoey box i mean yeah it doesn't take you know you've got some lovely cladding behind you there <laughs> <laughs> you know it doesn't take much to put a few rugs around the place yeah it's not, yeah yeah so, so stuff like that gets to me what podcasts are you listening to then oh true crime right um because it's going through the roof and i'm so I, it's uh, part of the reason that um it was sort of proposed is that i went out there and sort of researched it and came back to ben after that initial coffee um and saw that there was i mean the content is is the, but it's the sort of excitement and the chilling nature of it um, and the so, puzzle and how they tried to get away with it and it exactly. is yeah and there are so many crimes out there Yes. You know, you're not stuck, are you? Especially lockdown. What did you call it, Ben? The gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> you know, if you want to get rid of what was it? If if you want to get rid of um, a body during lockdown, then oh, well, uh, this yeah. it it may be a uh, COVID may have been a godsend for you. I'm quote <laughs> I'm quoting Ando. <laughs> that I mean, was kind so, of that first idea, wasn't it? Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah I know one. you you got right into the swing of things. So in oh, in yeah. in long answer form, um, I'm listening to. The the greats. I, I should probably give the um, the smaller podcasts a bit more of a mention. But if you just type true true crime in, then uh, the people who have been so they've also been really supportive. And there's a whole podcast community that we've been sucked into, and now we're very much hopefully a part of. But you know, um, Malice is is one of the the biggies, um, and Reverie True Crime as well. She's uh, there. They're both in the states. Those two. Mm. So there's I mean, a lot in the states. A lot there the is states, a lot in the states. Really big on it. But Lady Justice, who we spoke to yeah. the other day, um, yeah. they'll be they'll be very pleased for all this. But but then I feel I feel equally bad for the people that I dip in and out of who who are smaller. And there are literally hundreds that I'll I'll listen to a few seconds and then go back a week later, or I'll see them on social media or speak to them. And do you um, do you find yourselves covering the same crimes that they did? That's an interesting question. They oh, uh, the Americans of uh, obviously favor generally favor American crimes unless it's Yorkshire Ripper or something like that. And yeah. we've stayed away from that because we our time our the timing of the cases that Ben and I have have covered or been around um will be slightly different timing from the old old Goldies, you know. I mean, the, the, criminals. One of the one of the first cases I worked on, to any depth at all, was Fred and Rosemary West, and we talked about that. Yeah. And we talked about one subsequently. I mean, we're not saying we would never go on and talk about some of these older cases just from a historical perspective, but you know, for the first twenty four odd weeks of the podcast, it's largely been around our own direct experiences, cases that we have worked on, or cases that are in the news now that uh, that we respond to. Yes, we're doing um, that a bit more this summer. Because the summer's been a bit sort of changeable with sort of things um, coming in and out, and we've been a bit pushed for time for for other reasons. So um, that's that's worked out well. We just did a change of flavour, and so for example, our latest one we're talking about um, the Birmingham violence that's been happening over the weekend. Wow, um, you're, you're already talking about that, even though soon it will be an active court case, and we could get into. Well, you'd know better than I would yeah. about would the rules. Would you like on to that. produce us, Graham? <laughs> <laughs> no, that is actually quite a serious question. But no, no, yes. I mean, we, we're obviously careful about it, but we just, we thought it was too big an event. Yeah, everybody's talk talking about it. But yeah. we, we took an angle on it. So okay. That's how Funnily enough, it's it. the same angle that today was taking this morning as well, bizarrely. Um, well, so well, what, they, they predicted game, yeah. lockdown violence? Yeah, yeah well, no, they, they actually had somebody on saying uh, that um, this might be the first manifestation of um, sort of lockdown frustration where people just lose it. Um, a bit sort of a kind of Michael Douglas falling down moment, you know. I just, um, you know, you, you push people so to to a point where they just that's it. They've had enough frustrations built up. I can't take any more. Yeah, and they go bonkers. And this somebody was talking quite, you know, um, credibly about that this morning. And this is what, and that's what, that was our theory. That was what we were talking about um, the last couple of weeks about. We did today, yesterday. To <laughs> yes, we did two today, yesterday. <laughs> Are you married? There's, there's your, uh, there's your. Um... Your press release heading there straight yeah, away. We, we did, did today, today yesterday. yesterday. You're yeah. going to hear Ben really tapping good. away on the keyboard in a minute. Absolutely. <laughs> so do you I have a favourite case of all the cases you've covered? Oh, gosh. Uh, really difficult to say. I mean, I, I do keep coming back to Levi Belfield because he was just such a fascinating character. He was uh, so many contradictions and 
it was you know such a such a huge effort to actually track him down and find him and when you look at all i mean and, and a, a case where there was no hard evidence at all as because you know we talked to colin sutton who i've known for years who was the detective who led that investigation and it was all about circumstantial evidence and yet they build up they managed to build up through lots and lots of really detailed forensic work such a compelling overall picture that had belfield in the center of this kind of web of, of evidence that in the end the jury um, was clearly convinced of his guilt and, and you know unanimously found him guilty of, of the three murders but there was no there was no forensics there was no sort of like um you know dna type evidence so no, no hard, hard evidence, evidence at all no, all exactly. circumstantial no hard evidence still all convicted him. and they convicted him because of you know the, the the level of dedicated work that went into actually proving that it was him and, and showing that it had to be him because it couldn't be anybody else I so you also what I feel think. you you feel that there's been a slight miscarriage of justice um, when it comes to the Chillenden murders that we also covered. Yes. Which yeah, ones were they? Biggie. Just just um, bring me up to speed. That was Lynn Russell and um, Megan Russell were killed. Yeah. That's Lynn Russell's mum and the daughter of Megan Russell, and then Josie Russell, the other daughter, survived. And Michael Stone was convicted of those uh, murders twice, in fact, because he's had one case thrown out of the court. Of court of appeal but i'm still not convinced and i suspect that this could be uh, the work of levi belfield as many others do i mean i'm not you know in any way unique in thinking that but there's a lot of evidence that suggests it's far more likely to have been levi belfield that carried out the chillenden murders than the man who's serving a life sentence for it at the moment michael stone wow, wow. Mm. also wow. levi belfield's quite a I mean, if I say fascinating, I'm not giving it any positive taint there. Um, he's a, he's a, he's quite a character. <laughs> Why did you say taint? <laughs> <laughs> now, w without I mean, I threw that in just for you, Ben. <laughs> we're talking true crime, and without getting us into any trouble, and you know where the lines are legally on this. Sure. Have you got a view that you could happily broadcast? on the Madeleine McCann case because that's got to be at the moment the most mysterious yeah. one of all what really we happened? left that we did we you to, deliberately we, because no, no, we, we did it yeah we left it to Mark Williams Thomas to guide us um I don't and know if Mark? you know he has done you'll know him if you see him um he has done the investigator series okay um he's um and he's on good morning is it this he came, morning? He, yeah he came it, he but... came on as a guest he came on as a guest he's really interesting but no, I mean, ask you what we think. I mean, well, what I think certainly is that the latest suspect, the German paedophile they've identified, is a very, very strong suspect. Yeah. I don't think uh, that um, Maddie, Maddie's parents had anything to do with it. I don't think Kate and Jerry McCann were involved. Um, I know a lot of people on the Internet think that I have. I don't think that for a second. Um, do I think that they were perhaps, you know, they would regret leaving her in the hotel room, in the, the apartment? Yes, of course they would would regret that but at the same time it was a safe family environment they were there was monitoring supposedly of the rooms um and i do think that there was this is an opportune you know pedophile who has stepped in here and this this guy from germany seems very very um you know strong as a suspect and although as far as i'm aware they haven't yet found any you know proper um evidence other than circumstantial evidence that it could have been him he's he's boasted to friends about being involved and yes they know he was there through mobile phone tracking but beyond that no concrete evidence that it was him yes and that's what came out of all of our as, as a sort of united conclusion that we know that we don't know and we're yeah. sort of a little step closer to not knowing what yeah. the results of our investigations do you do you have any i i really don't know the whole thing just seems very bizarre to me none of it yes, seems to make definitely. sense to me and it, it always it feels to me like there's something there is some part of the story or some part of the puzzle missing, which is why it doesn't all fit together. And if that part of the puzzle yes. is that the German guy was was to do with it, then that's it. That's the that there's a missing piece to that. That definitely, I don't know what it is that's made it so. It's taken so long and cost so much money to uh, to get to the bottom of. But it was new for me, and it it might sound quite naive, but um, the theory that she walked out of the room that she was there were details that came about by because it's not a case that i'd really gone into in any great detail except sort of headlines and maybe one or two news lines um that she was complaining that they'd gone out before 
and she was upset and asking them questions about it. So for, you know, a little girl to sort of stray out of the room and venture out into the street, as Mark Williams Thomas suggested, to me makes quite a lot of sense. But then that upset some of the people who, there's a huge kind of group online, and this is something that became apparent, of um, people who want to blame um, Jerry and Kate. Yeah, there's there's a lot on appearance. YouTube, and it's pretty... Uh... It's pretty nasty stuff. It, it really is, yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, it, in some way, um, made sense that that might have happened, and that was a new theory to me. So that was something that was a, a definitely explored possibility and likelihood. And that's as far as we kind of got in terms of deductions of where, as you say, there's, there's missing yeah. evidence. But yeah. also, um, in the context of the, the, the missing part of the jigsaw that you mentioned there, I mean, that is also largely down to the incompetence of the police investigation, because in that, right. that crucial sort of first two, three, four hours after they were called in, they they failed to do so many basic um, scene containment things that normally would be done routinely yeah. that there will have been a lot of evidence lost for that reason. A lot of um, potential um, suspects, a lot of potential leads will have been missed because they um, they just seem to have been overwhelmed, inexperienced, and just not prepared for a case of that magnitude. Yeah. I spoke to, do you, do you listen to Red Handed, the true crime podcast? Yes. With, well, I yes. spoke to Saruti about really? uh, about two weeks ago. She lives up the road. She lives in Letchworth. So she's probably between <laughs> the two of us. Yeah. Uh, somewhere between Cambridgeshire and, and Hertfordshire. Yeah, she lives there. And uh, she, she, she also agreed that she didn't think the parents had anything to do with... Uh, with that one she also made some she also um because it's her and is it hannah that do that one it's two girls yes. and and yes. i asked them why are two what are two nice girls like you doing talking about true yeah, crime have and you some, heard them talking yeah <laughs> they um, know what they're doing <laughs> yeah uh, they swear more than you two uh, yeah we have to step it up yeah <laughs> to keep up but um Saruti said something interesting, and I wonder if you're finding this too with your one. Because I said, you know, why, you know, it's, it's two girls doing some horrific uh, crimes. She said, well, true crime females love true crime podcasts. Have you found that the feedback you're getting is from ladies more than men? Not necessarily. Really? But maybe it's sort of, Ben, I don't know. Ben, you're no, quite a sort of guy's. <laughs> guy on you are you i don't know you tell me maybe that's why or maybe I, i'm drawing them in who knows i i think that um i think that actually there are there is a particular sort of um cohort of women who are particularly interested in true crime you know including victoria um and i've noticed i mean if you think about malice if you think about um lady justice there are quite a few female true crime podders out there um, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but there's also a lot of female journalists who are drawn to true crime. So at the old right. there are lots of um, female court reporters as well as male court reporters. In I've fact, sat I mean, with just as many men, if not well, more. I'm just thinking of the press association ones that I know. There are far, there yeah. are more female press. Oh really? Journalists okay, probably. maybe it's just the randoms yeah. that I've sort of congregated. <clears> but I mean, you people. know, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think there is a gender bias here, but I certainly think it's fair to say that there is a cohort of of um, women who are particularly interested in true crime. But I suppose you could say there's also a cohort of men who are interested in true crime as well, like me. It's just a bunch of uh, nosy parkers. Yeah. Well, I, I assumed true crime was a blokey thing because the subject matter was so grisly. And oh, it's so funny. Have you seen Have you seen some of the people throwing out, looking for podcasts? I'm looking for because they get hooked and they're looking for more podcasts, more podcasts, and then they end up on our doorstep. And then <laughs> they say, we don't, we, oh, we don't want another one with a man. We don't want to hear more men or they don't want another. They don't like this type of accent. Sometimes they specify don't like British accents, don't like, <laughs> you know, any regional. Uh, we don't want any um, whiny Americans was one that I saw recently. Oh, yeah. Some of that PBS and, style is a little. Yeah. Yeah. Although some <laughs> of them are reading out stuff. I find yeah. Boring. We certainly yeah. don't do that. Saruti's yeah. theory was that, that it, it, true crime appeals to women because women are more often the victims of the oh, crime that's interesting and yeah. also that women are more conscious of their own safety than men are like you know a man walking home from the pub on his own is going to be a little bit wary but a woman could actually be terrified although i wonder statistically if um I, I don't, which I don't. one of those two is more likely 
Yeah. I think the men should be a lot more scared if they listen to <laughs> true crime. Yeah. But you do start sort of thinking, I'm a lot more safety conscious since I've been doing this because Are you you? Know, week after week. Oh, yeah. Because if week after week you're <laughs> sort of thinking the podcast and if I go out on a walk, I'm, I'll am i listen to us. And that's, you know, that's that's something when you when people say what podcast you listen to, I often say mine. <laughs> you can't say that. No, why not? <laughs> oh, well, maybe you should listen to us a bit more, Ben. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should. We're good. It's a great <laughs> podcast. So it's called You Didn't Let Me Finish. Ben Ando and Victoria uh, Mitzi, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure thank to talk you. to you and continued success with, <laughs> uh, with, with what is a great podcast. And thanks for being so open and honest about a few curly <laughs> questions there. I hope I didn't put you on the spot too much. Oh, you did. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice to talk to you. Take <laughs> Thank care. You, Cheerio.